Uh, thank you to Yvonne for setting this up. Uh, be sure to visit Build Academy where you'll find lots more of his courses, including a really long one that Yvonne and I did together on Frank Lloyd Wright. It's about 40 lectures, only about eight minutes each. So uh, we have a, you know, a ability to go in depth. And a while back, I wrote a book called Visionary Creativity, tell you why as we go. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And uh, so a little bit about me. I teach at Pratt Institute. I have online courses at Yvonne's Build Academy. Studied at the University of Pennsylvania with professors like Denise Scott Brown, Bob Venturi, Louis Kahn, Edmund Bacon. I've been an environmental sculptor, worked in major offices. Um, I'm director of research for something called Timeship, a cryonics facility. You'll find my radio podcasts at visionaries.podbean.com. These are some of my websites. <clears throat> Along with this video coming up, you'll find a hundred other of my videos on YouTube. I've written a couple books, so be sure to pre-order my new book on Louis Kahn with Monticelli Press. It's on Amazon and a book I did 40 years ago on Khan, still in print, and uh, my new book on visionary creativity, our topic for today. So let's start with what is creativity? So when I started writing this book, I read all the other books. <laughs> Nobody knows! <laughs> you know, we're all creative, uh, or uh, it has to do with neurotransmitters, or the what at the muamgagata, whatever part of the brain lights up when you're doing something creative. So I'm reading all this, you know, like uh, outtake bloopers from movies. People watch them after that; they're more creative. And I think is, Jesus, it's so. Too bad that Mozart didn't know about that. Think of what he could have done. So uh, I start by distinguishing between uh, mastery, innovation, creativity, and visionary creativity, which is what I'm interested in. So most of the books about creativity are actually about mastery. How many people have heard of the 10,000 hours thing? Anybody? Well, it's popularized by Malcolm Gladwell, but he's a journalist, he didn't originate it. But it turns out it takes about 10,000 hours of deliberate practice, which is carefully defined, to master a discipline. And studies have been done on soccer, chess, uh, piano playing, violin playing, um, et cetera. And it's universally true. Well, yeah, but that's mastery. The first violinist in an orchestra is not a composer. Um, he's not Beethoven or Mozart. There's a difference. And nobody understands what it is. So I define visionary creatives as visionary creatives swim in the culture of their day and manifest their in their work the spirit of their age. Now, right away I've introduced a term here, culture. Nobody knows what culture is. So we've got to understand culture because we don't live in the world. We live in our culture. And different cultures are different. And it can change. And one of the ways it's changed is through creativity. So uh, cultures are meaning systems. We create uh, cultures create us, and then we create our cultures. Where does that come from? Anybody know where that quote comes from? Winston Churchill. We shape our buildings. Thereafter, they shape us. And it's an interesting quote. It had to do with redesigning the Houses of Parliament. Visionary creatives change cultures and thereby bring about new worlds. And then... Um, Nobody talks about how destructive creativity is. 
one of the more creative ideas, and I don't distinguish between art, business, science, <clears throat> but one of the most creative recent acts in business has been Uber. Brilliant idea. There are all these people with nothing to do. All these cars are empty. I drive to work every day and there's one, two, three, four empty seats in my car. <laughs> You know, couldn't some computer figure out maybe somebody wants to join me? It's called Uber. And it's destroyed the yellow taxi industry. Suddenly people who paid a million dollars for a taxi license, it's now worth a half that. They've lost a half a million dollars. So creativity can be destructive. So to understand creativity and to understand ourselves, I think we have to go outside the social sciences. So if you want to understand us, psychology, social science, our society, I think all that's BS. They don't know, they have nothing to contribute to creativity. Psychology, sociology, neuroscience tell us nothing about creativity. And these are some of the figures I've studied with over the years. So I'm not going to go through who they all are. You can guess. <laughs> But um, these people are not comprehensible by social sciences. These people are massively, majorly creative. They lived in different worlds than we live in, and they brought those worlds to us. That's creativity. Someone discovers a new world and seeks to bring it to the rest of us. So. <clears throat> What is that world like? Um, the truth of history lies in biological power, in pure vitality, in what is in man of cosmic energy, not identical with, but related to, the energy which agitates the sea, fecundates the beast, causes the tree to flower and the star to shine. Ortega y Gasset. Joseph Campbell, myth is a secret opening through which the inexhaustible energies of the cosmos pour into cultural manifestations. Van Gogh, wings, wings to fly above life, wings to fly above the grave and death. That is what we want, and I'm getting to understand that we can get them. So what was Van Gogh experiencing? I mean, not what we experience. <laughs> and then, he struggled to bring it to us. And as successful as his painting was, as miserable as his life was, he was never unhappy about the miserableness of his life. He was unhappy that he could not do better at bringing to us this vision, this world that he lived in. So let's pause. Anybody want to raise their hands? Um, what is your definition? of creativity. Any thoughts? And you can now unmute your microphones if you want to share. Yeah. Speak up or you'll get called on. <laughs> well, have... take, keep a notepad with you and make notes. If you don't speak up now, you can speak up at the end. We have Alan Steinfeld who just joined us. Yeah. And you wanted to ask you some yeah, yeah, questions. I was, so I just wanted to say, it seems like, you know, creativity is at the source of all human expression, even conversation. So yeah, some people you've highlighted had a remarkable sense of how to innovate creativity, but we as expressive communicative beings are creative as our core. Uh, very good. Now, you notice, uh, let's go back here. And uh, I distinguish between creativity and visionary creativity. So for me, visionary creativity is that which brings about a new culture, changes the world. So um, we're all creative. As you say, conversation, uh, Noam Chomsky points out that you know, every time we speak, we say something that's never been said before. 
billions of people for thousands of years, and we're creating new, unique things at every moment. But that's not what I'm addressing. What I'm addressing is what creates the world, the web, the network in which we exist, and how visionary creatives change that. So we'll see more of that as we go on. So I'm, more thoughts. I'm, I'm wondering, John, whether creativity, it comes from something that already exists in the collective consciousness and then it's, it's somehow synthesized or brought together by people who have this capacity to really understand what is going on there and to manifest it into this reality. I think it's uh, circular. And, in and, other and, words, visionary creatives swim in the culture of our day. Now, I don't want to pick on anybody else, so I'll say me. I live in the past. I live in what I think is reality because that's what I grew up in. A visionary creative experiences a whole new reality that now I'll pick on everybody else. The rest of us don't see. And they say, what's wrong with everybody? Why can't they see it? And then they create things that bring it to the rest of us. Well, so I think I know what, to, yeah. No, oh, I get what you mean, what you're saying now. And I think also what Yvonne was saying, it seems like these visionary cultural creatives are part of a, a mood, a mode of time, a time flow, like the way jazz and abstract painting and quantum physics all emerged around the same time. So there's a sort of um, flow of, of, uh, of uh, consciousness within the collective that shows up in different ways. What exactly. You You're that? anticipating where we're going here. Okay, good. Any other thoughts? Okay. Now, oh, one more point to pick on all of us, including myself. <clears throat> In this book, I repeat this, same over here, about a dozen times, because we don't see what we see. We see what we think we see. And everybody comes, people have an idea of what they understand creativity to be, and they think that's what I say. And um, so I try in my book to be, <laughs> people say, you're getting repetitive. <laughs> I say, well, let's, my students say that. They say, in a course evaluation, it's too repetitive. I said, well, let's see if anybody gets it at the end of the course, because I know how many courses I didn't get till decades later. So um, we see what we think is there rather than what's actually in front of our eyes. So let's talk more about that. Ah, uh, let's real quick. Anybody know who this is? Any architects here? Interesting, okay, I'll run through them quickly. Louis Kahn, most important American architect after Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, Bob Venturi and his wife, Denise Scott Brown, inventors of postmodernism in architecture. Um, Edmund Bacon, uh, greatest 20th century city planner, builder of modern Philadelphia. Mythologist Joseph Campbell, Tai Chi master Chin Meng Chang, who most modern Tai Chi was created by him. Chung of Trumpa Rinpoche, Tibetan master, first Tibetan to come to the, uh, the West. Bill Katavalis, professor at Pratt. Uh, Harmon, uh, teacher of modern shamanism. And Stephen Wolfram, computer scientist, who if you look him up, and go to his recent YouTubes. One month ago, he totally revolutionized physics. He unified quantum theory and relativity and showed that the universe is based on, is rule-based. So these are some of my teachers. <laughs> uh, so I'm looking to understand 
what they're doing. So, uh, who brought this up about jazz, et cetera, and quantum theory? It, anyway, we're going to look at it. Was, it was Alan Steinfeld. Yeah, okay, I think that. So, let's look at our emerging 21st century. So, here we are <clears throat> with the Renaissance, you know, roughly a couple, a couple hundred years. There's Leonardo da Vinci, his Madonna of the Rocks. And here is a cartoon or sketch he did for Adoration of the Magi. And we see he's using single point perspective. All these lines vanishing at this point right here. And he was so enamored of the sketch that he never painted over it. <laughs> and the client had paid for it, never got it. Where's my painting? So I think I want to keep it. Uh, but what, he, what is he saying? He's saying that there's a uniform space and time. We can be observers of it. You can freeze one moment of that time and locate the location of every object with its velocity in that moment in time. That's what perspective is. That's exactly what Newtonian physics is doing, except the artists were 200 years ahead of them. Um, and here we have Salvador Dali's melting watches, time is malleable, and who's this? It's because he's young, it's hard to tell. Einstein, before he had the frizzy hair. So that's what I'm looking at. These different periods like quantum theory and jazz, the Renaissance, the chronological novel, perspective painting, Newtonian physics, uh, modernism, relativity, um, surrealist painting, the stream of consciousness novel of Proust, Joyce, and Wolf. So what about today? In 1964, uh, <coughs> John Bell publishes Bell's Theorem on quantum entanglement. Two particles become entangled, influence each other, separate. They can be on two different sides of the universe. You look at one, you change the other. The universe is tied together. Everything going on on Alpha Centauri is reflected right now in the molecules in my thumb. The world is put together totally differently than we thought. There's a great British, um, cosmologist and astronomer James Jeans, he says, the universe is beginning to look more and more like a great thought than a great machine. Uh, Lynn Margulies totally overthrew Darwin. Darwin says, slow changes through natural selection brings about evolutionary change. Evolution is true. There are creatures on the earth today descended from the creatures in the past that were different. The question is, how'd that happen? Darwin had a particular theory, natural selection. The Margulis says, it doesn't work. What's going on is whole genomes get moved from one creature to another, carried by microorganisms. Bacteria and viruses move around whole genomes. I've been showing this slide for 10 years. <laughs> Suddenly it's making us nervous. But that's what's going on right now. The whole species is changing. This is Stephen Wolfram. A great quote of his. I think when I find the code that generates our world, it will be about six lines. This is called Game of Life, John Conway's Game of Life. This is a glider gun. <laughs> so this arrangement based on rules is generating these guns, manufacturing them. Maybe this whole different, you know, we're not gonna be industrial forever. This whole new model's coming. Well, he just did, he just found it. So this book's coming out end of the month and you can find, um, a dozen three-hour videos where he's presenting this new vision. 
but the universe is rule-based generated. What else is generated by simple rules? Well, I, maybe I don't have that slide. Life, <laughs> DNA is four letters, A, T, C, G, two rules, A and T can link, C and G can link, and 20 parts, the amino acid. That's it. Four letters, two rules, 20 parts. You can make all of life. So since we're mostly, I think most of us are in the arts, um, let's go to metaphor. So there's a Hindu myth called Indra's net. And Indra's net, Indra is king of the gods like Zeus. In his palace is a great chandelier and in, as a net. And every intersection of the net is a faceted jewel. Every facet of every jewel reflects all of the other jewels. Every part of the universe is in every other part of the universe, infinitely. Because you then look in one of those facets and you see the whole thing reflected including facets, etc. Here's another metaphor. Surat's Sunday afternoon in the park. In the, from the distance, we look like discrete biological creatures, like these classical, stately classical creatures of Surat. But zoom in and zoom in and we see it's made up of these pointless dots. The world and we are clusters of interconnected fractal networks computationally generating themselves and each other. Now, what's my point gonna be? The visionary creatives of our day are the ones who, I know this, but I don't live it. The visionary creatives of the day are people who are living in this world and they're saying, why doesn't anybody get it? Today's visionary creators are natives of this world. We like to say a digital native. Children are, you know, I, I got my first iPad. I couldn't turn it, I'm sorry, iPod, the music. <clears throat> Although I got books on mine. I couldn't turn it on. Took it to school and I handed it to a kid in the front row. I said, how do I turn this on? He says, well, first you unlock it. <laughs> and, you know, like I asked, we used to have a prank where I teach the whole base in the library had computers and they were teaching word processing. I asked my students, how many people have had a course in word processing? None. They're born knowing it. <laughs> visionary, today's visionary creators are natives of this world of clustered interconnected fractal networks computationally generating themselves and each other. The things they create in architecture, art, design, science, technology, business, make this world apparent to the rest of us. This is my first computer. I was the first person, I, I got my first Mac in the first 100 days. It was self-contained. I had a modem, but there wasn't much you could do with it. Today, I'm looking at my computer and right next to the uh, file folders will be a little cloud. I asked my techie, what does that mean? He says, it means the stuff in that folder is not on your computer. I said, what? That's my book. <laughs> he says, it's in the cloud. I said, well, 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 we have, well, what if I go to the basement and I can't get to it? <laughs> that the world's changing. You know, I, it's like, I don't want it in the cloud. I want it on my device. Well, that, that's because I'm living in an old world. So we look at Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, iCloud, Amazon, Google, Microsoft. And we get it, we're upset about these companies right now. I don't know how we'd be functioning without them. <clears throat> I mean, I'm ordering from Amazon every day. I can't go out of my apartment. All the stores are closed and it shows up. Now it's three days instead of two days. So what, 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 how are these, how has our world changed? And we don't realize it. Now, uh, I address architecture and design, Pratt's at Design School, 
And uh, I can't talk without cough drops. Pardon my uh, <coughs> raspy voice. I'm, uh, I, 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 I'm in the school of Dr. Fauci. So, um, okay, so we can make these new worlds inside the computer. How do you self-generate a world outside the computer? Neil Gershenfeld at MIT is doing it. To do so, he's created a new computer architecture. He's um, says Turing and von Neumann uh, models of the computer are over. The process of is <laughs> the computation is in the material. So think of Lego blocks. How you can assemble Lego blocks comes from the child working on them, but also from the Lego blocks. You can't just do it any way. The, the Lego blocks are telling you what you can and can't do. We have a computer which talks to the printer, which puts the ink on the paper. What if the paper did the whole thing? That's what Gershenfeld's done. He's created computers like that, that they can actually make the thing. The computational process is in the material. Now, how far along is this? Well, he's working with Airbus <laughs> to self-assemble jumbo jets. That's how far along they are. So think of a 3D printer that can make anything. How's that going to change things? Well, right now, we go to school to get an education, to gain a skill, to get a job, to make money, to buy what we need. What if you just 3D print whatever you need? Skip the whole thing. The world's totally changing. There are people who get it, who live in that world. Those are the visionary creatives. <clears throat> These are some of my colleagues. <clears throat> Carl Shu gives his students three genes at the beginning of the semester, DNA. By the end of the semester, the building has grown itself. Elena Manfredini applies this to fashion and architecture. Haresh Lalvani. Here's the uh, morphological universe he lives in. These columns are in the Museum of Modern Art, permanent collection. The forms of these columns, the information for what's happening to these columns does not come from the machine. It comes from the material. The information, the computation is in the material. Totally new way of thinking. If you wanted to make an oak tree, you would not put a pole in the ground nail sticks to the pole, glue leaves to the sticks. What would you do? Plant an acorn, let the stupid thing make itself. Our phones are so smart, why aren't they making themselves? Gershenfeld's working on it. So what are these people actually doing? Do we understand what's going on? Uh, sometimes I compare this Tesla to a um, Chevy Bolt. They're both electric cars. They're both good cars. I see Teslas on the road every day when I go out, used to. I've never seen a Chevy Bolt. Why not? General Motors doesn't get it. General Motors makes cars and it puts computers in them. Elon Musk makes software and he puts it in computers that have wheels. It's a totally different way of thinking. These are the visionary creatives who are changing our world. We don't always like it. So uh, I described our emerging 21st century as network genomics. Anybody want to jump in and um, present alternative views? I happen to be kind of techie. You know, I'm into this techie stuff and cosmology. But that doesn't mean that, you know, it could be um, you're seeing as a result of the virus, new kinds of communities emerging. 
it could be whatever. Anybody have any thoughts about what our 21st century is all about? Okay, write your thoughts down and uh, we're almost done, but we've got a couple more things to do and then we'll see at the end, uh, maybe we'll call on people. <laughs> so how do you become a visionary creative? So I do a course on vision and creativity. So, you know, my students are interested. Um, this is a little bit of field of what I want to say, but I love this essay. New York Times. So go to New York Times and then put in how to raise a creative child. And you'll find me a full article. It's brilliant. Um, step one, back off. But <clears throat> toward the end, and he's, He's attacking the tiger mom. Uh, but uh, in the article toward the end, he says, Let's, studies have been done to compare Nobel Prize winners with other excellent scientists in their field who did not win a Nobel Prize. The Nobel Prize winners are 22 times more likely to perform as actors, dancers, or musicians, 12 times more likely to write poetry, novels, plays, seven times more likely to dabble in arts and crafts, two times more likely to play a musical instrument or compose music. So this has to do with lateral thinking. You know, really all human thought is metaphorical. You understand something by, oh, it's like that. You know, we, we talk about the spin of a particle. What's that? that doesn't spin. You know, tops spin. Particles don't spin. But it's a metaphor we use to help understand it. So, a great teacher in this is Friedrich Nietzsche from the Spoke Zarathustra. The three metamorphoses of the spirit. The camel, the lion, and the child. So the spirit kneels down like a camel wanting to be loaded. What's he talking about here? Anybody want to jump in? What does it mean by the camel becoming loaded? Learning the basics. I remember being in the seventh grade saying, how long do I have to do this? Why aren't you born knowing this stuff? <laughs> Why do I have to learn algebra? Why, why, did, you know, why aren't you born knowing this? Like my students are born knowing word processing. So um, it's learning your culture in general and the basics of your field. So some of the biggest best-selling books still today, and you know, a few years ago, but they're still way up there. The Battle Hymn of the Tiger Mother, Outliers by Gladwell, Duckworths, um, Grit. These are all about mastery. The camel, that's just the beginning. You know, you want people who have like really mastered the thing. Okay, now what? So, um, Woodrow Wilson said, the business of the university is to impart the right thought of the world, the thought through the, the principles which have stood through the seasons have become at length part of the immemorial wisdom of the race. Well, that's only step one. How about to question if we need to overthrow and replace the immemorial wisdom of the race? That defines visionary creativity. The camel then becomes a lion who would conquer his feeder and be master in his own desert. So think of the people we respect. Beethoven, mastered the Viennese symphony of Haydn and Mozart before he went on to overthrow it and launch Romanticism. Picasso mastered classical painting by the time he dropped out of the academy. Thelonious Monk worked with the jazz greats in the creation of bebop before entering his own world. Robert Venturi understood modernism better than his, uh, that he attacked, better than did his critics. So it's, look at people we respect, 
who brought about something totally new. Very often they had totally mastered what came before. But there's the next step. For ultimate victory, the lion wants to fight with the great dragon. The great dragon is thou shalt. You study with a master. You love them. You appreciate them. You learn from them. But then I think there's something they don't have quite right. And you have to overthrow them if you're a visionary creator. But the creation of new values, the lion is not capable of this. But to create freedom, the, the lion creates the freedom, but then the child brings about the new. The child is innocent and forgetting, a new beginning, a wheel rolling out of its own center. And here's the star child of 2001, the new stage of the human race. So, can visionary creativity be dangerous? So let's save that, and I've got a couple slides to wrap up. What about you? So, anybody, raise your hand if you don't know all three. Einstein, we already identified when he was young, before his hair got out of control. Isaac Newton and J.K. Rowling, Harry Potter. Anybody know something they all have in common? When did Newton create his theory of gravity, theory of motion, and optics, all in two years? What was going on? He, he created during the plague of... Um, Why? And what was he doing during the plague? London. He was he in the had, countryside. Right. He had to be alone. Try being alone yeah. for two years. Master the material and then get away for two years and think about it. The Einstein was so bright, he could do his patent work in an hour in the morning. And they kept trying to give him promotions to be a supervisor. <laughs> this is, wouldn't take the promotion. He wanted to spend the rest of the day thinking. So ask yourself, what is obvious to everyone else but does not seem quite right to you? And then ask, what if? So one of my people I like to follow, you know, on YouTube lectures and stuff is Peter Thiel, part of the mafia uh, PayPal Mafia, financier of SpaceX and uh, Tesla. What do you believe, this is his favorite interview question when interviewing people. What do you believe that few others believe? So that's step one. He said, well, the American educational system is broken. Well, yeah, everybody knows that. What do you believe that not everybody else believes? And here's the hard part. Do you dare say? Thank you. So let me get, hey, uh, any slides people want to go back to? If not, I'll get out so I can see everybody. Thank you, John. This was fantastic. Thank you so okay, much for I'm gonna stop joining us. Screen. And uh, yes, you're welcome to stop sharing so we can see yeah, our let guests. Me get, and uh, my cursor back. Uh, now you say just stop sharing. It's on the top of your screen. Yeah, yes. I needed the cursor. Um, Fantastic. Let me yeah. Go to. So, so John, before we start Hi, the, the discussion, yes. Now you're welcome to to. Um, well, let me turn to, on. to unmute yourself if you want to uh, speak with with John and yeah, with myself. Yeah. And and John, I really wanted to thank you for your presentation, and uh, I didn't get to to introduce John properly, but John and I used to teach at Pratt Institute years ago, and uh, he's one of my most creative colleagues who has been through many different phases and has seen many different things. So he's kind of the living history of Pratt Institute. And he's one of the people who can bridge so many different fields, you know, from uh, architecture, design, art, but 
also history, technology, uh, cryonics and uh, life sciences and so on. So it's really uh, a pleasure to have him here with us today and to share a topic that has nothing to do with architecture, which is what we usually uh, talk about, but has to do a lot with creativity in general. So if I may, John, um, start this conversation by, by going a bit further into how creativity happens or, or how do we manifest things into this world? You know, for me personally, um, there is a, something called quantum field or collective consciousness from where a lot of things happen and then some people are able to access that quantum field and they're able to manifest things in our reality through their access to that field and through their particular abilities. And for example, if you think about Einstein or Tesla or Newton or any of these people who we uh, uh, keep in high regard for what they have contributed to society, a lot of them say that they've actually came up with their inventions in their dream state when they accessed that information you know while they were asleep or during meditation you know they somehow got these messages somehow got these visions that later manifested into whatever was it was whether it's a theory or or technology or something that needed to happen for society so you know i'm just wondering if you can give us some more of your interpretation how does creativity actually happen and how can we tap into that field by removing the obstacles that we have in our life by tuning in with ourselves and with this vision that uh, we have for the future and how do we manifest this into our uh, world in our life and, and share it with others yeah um okay i'm gonna say something two things uh, both of them are a bit unfortunate one is i some people are more like that and you know, i'm working on another book on creativity and in it i talk about uh, maybe half a dozen personality types visionary creatives who live in the emerging world and seek to bring it to the rest of us. Um, actives, people who, the ultimate active is special forces, you know, Olympic athletes with guns. When they leave the military, what are they gonna do? They become fire jumpers. <laughs> they go to California and jump out of airplanes to fight forest fires. Uh, the, you know, the, the story is the patrolman on the beat as a cop. Um, wants to get promoted to be detective and sit at a desk. No, a lot of them like to be outdoors moving around. They don't want to be stuck at a desk. And so um, uh, vis spiritual visionaries who want to experience transcendence, um, managers who want to make things happen for other people. So, um, you know, we see in organizations, maybe the less technologically or educationally brilliant people become the deans and presidents because, you know, if they want to be writing their book, they can't be fundraising, <laughs> you know, managing. But there are people who love doing that. So first thing is, I think it's a type. A visionary creative is a type. We're not all visionary creative. Um, you can't train to be an active. If you don't like to be outdoors, um, you know, hiking in the woods, um, don't do it. There are people who enjoy that. The other part is, <clears throat> which I think is very important and is again, unfortunate. And that's the two years alone to have had a really good education, you know, to master the classics, understand your field. Uh, <clears throat> mine was architecture. And I happened to be at a wonderfully confluent moment where 
My school had five years before I got there, I exited the Beaux-Arts. So there was still an appreciation for what the Beaux-Arts had to offer. Half the faculty came from Harvard, had studied with Gropius, so it brought the Bauhaus into it. Um, two of my teachers were Denise Scott Brown and Robert Venturi, who are already challenging modernism and introducing postmodernism. And all of what I saw in their work, what we did in the studio, what I read, gave me the background for all three of these traditions. So then when I um, was able to do an independent master's degree, and I just sat on a, at a desk for two years with books piled up. And I said, wait a minute, how did Einstein get from the Lorentz transformations to general, uh, to special relativity? And how does that relate to what Picasso was doing in Les Demons of Avignon? I had a week to just sit there and, and think about it and read what people said about Les Demons of Avignon and figure out the Lorentz transformation formulas. So to have that opportunity and, um, <clears throat> you know, that's a failing of education today that our students graduate in debt and right away they have to go to work to pay it back. The part about the year bumming around Europe to see what you really want to do has been um, curtailed. So those are the two things I think we can do. Be of that type if you're not, do what you're really good at and have that opportunity to spend two years alone. And if we're all beyond that, then the people we're responsible for children and nieces and nephews, um, try to enable it to happen for them. Awesome, thank you, John. So I, I invite, I invite um, our guests to, to ask questions if they want to. I have uh, like a, a whole list of things that I would like to discuss in, in, uh, oh. With John, but I would like to invite our guest because I'm sure that this uh, conversation has inspired some some questions and reactions. So, um, yes. Um, Here is our gallery view. I'm looking at Tom Klinkelstein, who's one of the most creative people around, is here. So, Tom, speak up. What have you been up to? Are you still at Pratt? I, yeah, I am still at Pratt. Yep, still teaching in graduate communication design and um, still traveling the world, except in the past month. Mostly into the future. Good, good to hear you. Excellent presentation. Very Thank excited you. about the content and the uh, threads that you wove. Thanks, thanks. And what are you going to ask, Tom? What are you going to ask John? So, Tom, just tell us what you're working on. <laughs> you're still working on a, uh, you were working on self-building websites, right? You know, you know, I, I, I invented a, uh, uh, a fictional, uh, persona who lives in the uh, last half of this century. And I've done four of those projects in the past 15 years. So I'm currently, uh, finishing the, uh, the, the newest one that has to do with, uh, what I call the moment of original manifestation, which is, what are those early events in one's life, three, four, five, 10, 12 years old, that in some um, considered or random way influence what you end up doing later in your life? So I interviewed over 100 uh, uh, people around the world, politicians in Greenland, uh, neurophysicists in Copenhagen, many designers, uh, many artists, many academics, entrepreneurs, and uh, weaving that together into this uh, fictional persona and the, uh, the world that exists around them later in this century. So half fact, half many, lots of fiction and lots of speculation. Great, great. So um, let's see, uh, are you on Twitter? Tom? Me? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, so everybody here, um, uh, Link up to Tom on Twitter and Tom, uh, and you can see his name, spell it out on the screen there. <laughs> Thank and, you, John. Uh, Tom, be sure to post where these things are available when they are. 
I will. I will. I'll, I'll, um, I'll post on Facebook as well if you want to. Uh, there's a, right. a recent video series about people, their philosophies, and the places they live that was just uh, released from some people in London. I'll, it's posted there on my Facebook uh, page. If anybody wants to see it, I'd be happy to, to uh, have you as a friend. Awesome. Thank you, Tom. Right. Thank you. Do we have anyone else who wants to share something? If not, John, I, I have a question for you. Sure. Uh, more of a reaction and question to what you just shared. You know, you were talking about these visionary creatives and you asked us, how do we define the 21st century? I think the 21st century is just beginning. So it's going to be still hard to define uh, what it is like, you know, because we don't know what's going to happen. And uh, we're now at a kind of a, a cocooning, in a cocooning phase where, you know, we've been living as caterpillars and, and we are in a cocoon now and hopefully we'll emerge as butterflies. So we don't know what the butterfly would look like until it, it comes out. So it's still to be, to be determined what this century would be. But I personally hope that it would be more of a century of solidarity and more of a century of co-creation because a lot of these great geniuses that uh, you, you have shown us and a lot of the people that we recognize as, as creatives, yes, they have created something extraordinary, but I'm, I'm just hoping that people focus a bit more on service to others in this new century. Uh, and hopefully this time of the pandemic in which we are now would inspire people to, to think about more about the collective and think about how they contribute to others. And, and for me particularly, the, the creativity, visionary creativity has two parts. You know, one is, yes, getting a brilliant idea, but then actually more than two, many parts. First is getting a, a, a brilliant idea of what the future could be and eventually channeling down something from the future into the present. And then the next phase is making it happen, all right? Because you, know, you can have the most brilliant idea, but if you're not able to, to execute it, then you know, it's never going to, to work. You know? Facebook is not by far the, the first social network. You know, there were many others that were before that, but uh, you know, they were able to, to make it work iPhone was not the first smartphone. There were many other uh, smartphones before that, but no, no, no one was able to, to make it work as, as well as, as Apple back in the days. And so, you know, this uh, moment of, of being the generator and, and uh, actually making things happen, it's such an important phase of being creative and, and manifesting that work of the visionary creative into the present. But the part that I'm really, um, really interested in is, is about how do you contribute with whatever work you're doing to the evolution of our collective, to the next phase of its existence, all right? Which I believe it's also essential for whatever we are manifesting. You know, none of these technologies would have been so impactful. None of these inventions and theories would have been so in impactful if they were not actually doing service in doing something in service of, of our communities. And therefore, my question to you is how do we inspire people to actually focus more on the service to others and, and, and less on the service to self? Okay, um, I'm gonna go back to something I said and expand on it a little. I don't have, I mean, I don't wanna break away from the screen to open my manuscript. But uh, as I said, I've been working on this. And I, again, I think there are, you know, psychology has personality types and there are uh, introverts and extroverts and agreeables and less agreeables, the, the whole matrix of these types. And <clears throat> Um, I'm looking at something a bit different, where there are visionary creatives, managers, um, nurturers, producers. So 
there's a producer of a movie. You know, the screenwriter and the director, <laughs> it's not going to go anywhere. The, and the producer is not doing anything creative. They're on the phone to the bank. They're on the phone to the distributor. They're on the phone to the printer, you know, for the posters. Um, they're on, they're buying film stock. Um, all this stupid stuff. Well, there are people that just love doing that. And so I think that what our educational system owes us is, and I have faith that there's just the right numbers of each one to make a coherent cooperative society. You know, rather than saying we should, oh, being creative is being selfish. No, there are enough people that want to be nurturers. Uh, I mean, if people become nurses, they don't do it for the, you know, because the pay is so high. They do it because that's, they're as driven to do that as I am to sit with a pile of books on my desk and write another book. Um, so that I, I think we should have faith in the distribution of uh, these types throughout, uh, you know, among people and that we should help and encourage each to become what they uh, most want to become. And I think it's tragic when someone doesn't become what they could have been. You know, there's all these movies from the 30s about somebody wants to be a violin player and they have to go work for the bank, uh, or be an accountant to feed their family in the, in the, on the Lower East Side. And we feel bad about that because they should have been a violinist. Uh, and there are other people, I, I described it to my accountant and he says, that's how I feel about accounting. <laughs> you know, great, I love it that, he's, that there's somebody watching that I, my taxes get filed right. And he loves doing that. So um, <laughs> I think that the best we can do is help everybody become what they really are all about. And that will give us the nurturers and producers and cooperators along with the visionary creators. I, there was a friend of the family, my parents' friends, they had a kid about my age, a bit younger, when I was in uh, high school. And he liked to hang out with his buddies, go out in the car and cruise and hang out with his buddies. And uh, he got drafted in the military age, like late 50s. This is great. I'm going to be in the army. I'll be outdoors. They discovered he was good with computers. <laughs> and he got locked down to a desk. He got out of the army. He became a cop. He said, great. Now I can get in the car and cruise the neighborhood. They discovered he was good with computers. He got stuck at a desk running the police department computer. Now, there are people who would love that. You know, these nerds who just want to sit in front of the screen. He wanted to be out and active. So I think uh, hopefully we can all find what we're best at and it will be just the right distribution. Thank you so much, John. Yeah, that's a great wish. So I wanted to see if I had a, I had a, a, a question oh. for, the whole, for the whole group, if that's okay. Yeah. Yes. Anybody, anybody who wants to, just picking up on something that was said a few minutes ago, I would, uh, I would be interested in hearing about what unexpected um, opportunities uh, will come from this, uh, this Black Swan event, this unexpected pandemic. Um, what, what may come that we don't expect to come? You know, besides things like uh, more of what we're doing right now, the things that are relatively easy to predict, um, you know, any any speculative uh, questions or or attempts at a, an answer would be appreciated from from the whole group, John, and plus everyone else. I would like to answer this question. Sure. Can you hear me well? Yes. Okay. So. Um, about this pandemic, what, what is funny to me was that 
I was involved in a emerging party in Romania, and um, I wanted to uh, introduce this this idea um, to be, you know, supported by the party at a national level of online education. And um, I, I presented my idea to the party ruler and everything, but um, before they managed to do anything, this pandemic came, and uh, with this pandemic my idea was actually implemented like on a national and global level because now we we realize how important it is to uh to be able to um you know have education in an online form because it's more it gives uh, an equal chance to everyone to access the same content the same quality content like the the best quality that can be but it can be distributed equally to everyone uh, of course if they have access to resources like internet and you know devices and that, that sort of stuff but i think like one of the major advantages of this pandemic was uh, the fact that it forced us to connect on an online level and i think further it's gonna help us evolve you know into a more network network consciousness very good. Other thoughts about that? How many people are doing things like this quite a bit in the past few weeks? Anybody else? Yep. Yeah, I teach, I teach at a art and architecture school, so I've been online with all my classes. Well, so hopefully... What, what this... Go ahead. Go ahead, Tom. Uh, so in regard to that last comment, that was uh, Bella, I believe. Yes. Uh, so Bella, what does that mean? That um, what does how does what does the word network mean differently uh, three years from now, three years past this immediate event than it meant three years before, or even uh, uh, two or three decades ago when it was first used in regard to things like the internet. Well, now I was thinking, uh, I was talking about this network of um, human minds where, you know, each mind is a node in the network and through internet, we can, um, we can now transform more and more information and make more and more connections. And I think like this concept will evolve, you know, uh, in a network that has like more and more connections and each node as as they gather more connections they are able to uh, to bring like to compute more information and then output more information into the network so that will like solidify in a sort of overmind i it's my idea so some some sort of uh collective capacity at a much uh, larger scale than was previously occurring. So anybody who's interested in this, uh, look, search on Google for Global Brain. There's about three books with that title, but people speculating about this over the past some years. Fantastic. Thank you, John and Bell and Tom for your comments. I, I think the fact that we are having a conversation like this, it's, it's part of one of the advantage of uh, having a pandemic, you know, because probably this would have not happened if, uh, if we were just having events in New York City and, and talking to people who are physically near us. So I think this is already a huge advantage uh, for many of us. And, um, you know, my, what I, what I really hope is that this time would be kind of an accelerated two years of what John was talking about. He said, you know, first you, you load yourself with the information and then you take two years off and you think about it and then, and then you come back and, and manifest something into this world. Now, the time in today flies with a totally different speed and, and, uh, than, than the time of, of Newton, for example, or... or any of those uh, other people that we discussed. So I would tend to think that the two years that they had earlier could happen in the two months in which we are having uh, during this pandemic uh, of, of just being away from, from everyone else and, and, and having more time to, 
to look inward instead of outward. So I really hope that this pandemic would be the base for many people to manifest so many uh, visionary, creative uh, inventions, technologies, uh, communities, projects that would uh, uh, would come to being into the next years after we are back to whatever the next phase is. All right, and so that's uh, that's what I think is one of the good benefits of of what is going on now. The other thing is a lot of things are um, being uncovered and a lot of things are are kind of coming to the surface of of things that we did not before know before so this has really been an opportunity to to dive deeper into some knowledge that we did not have access to before and see how it actually has impact on our life on our society so um, now that we have access to some of it i think we will have to be making different choices and we will have to be more conscious about how we live and, and how we uh, connect to others, how we collaborate with others and how we uh, bring things, projects into this um, reality. So that's, um, that's my little um, contribution to what I think the, the benefits of of this uh, pandemic will be, I think it's it's totally unpredictable. You know, people were saying, let's go back to normal. And I'm saying, you know, there's no going back. There's only going forward, you know. There's no way we can go back to to what we had before. We just have to go forward and see what we have in the future. A lot of my friends have left New York for good and they never plan to come back. So it'll be interesting to see what happens to cities. Uh, in the past century, we saw movement from countryside to the cities. And during the pandemic, we're seeing it going backwards, people going from dense places and big cities to as far as they can and as close from, from other people and from, from density and as close as they can to nature. So we'll see if this return to nature is, is something that will persist or, or it's a temporary thing. But um, I'm hopeful that it will really give us an opportunity to, to think differently, live differently, work differently, and, and be different people. So uh, I'm excited to whatever we have to do next. And this is one of the things that we are doing at Build Academy. I can share a few words about that. Build Academy is a platform for professional solutions and education. We're bridging design, architecture, entrepreneurship, uh, and consciousness into this manifested manifestation of new reality and the new world that we are co-creating. So if uh, any of you is interested in learning more about what we do, we have a platform, buildacademy.com, with more than 20 online courses and programs. John and I taught a few courses together, like Modern Architecture and uh, Frank Lloyd Wright. I have a course on contemporary architecture. Uh, a lot of my co colleagues and friends have done courses on uh, photography, design, art history, uh, real estate, marketing, and so on. So I invite you to check it out, buildacademy.com, and to consider becoming a member. We have membership that is uh, you know, either free if you want to access some of the basic courses, or then we have pro and plus and premium memberships if you want, uh, let's say certificates, or if you want attention from um, our faculty, or if you want your assignments to be graded, or if you want to participate in some of our private groups and masterminds. So that is my uh, invitation for you. We will be hosting these events uh, regularly in the next weeks. Now that we're all um, working virtually and, and staying mostly at home. So I'll make sure I invite you to whatever we have in the next weeks. And I really hope to see you again. And I really want to thank Professor John Lobel for joining us today. You know, it's been a phenomenal lecture. And uh, John, thank you for bringing your wisdom to us. Here is his book, Visionary Creativity. You can find it on Amazon. 
and you can dive deeper into his wisdom and knowledge. Uh, I personally have been quite inspired by, by this book. So I hope that uh, you can read it too and, and tell us what you think about it. So with that, um, John, would you like to say a few final words to Thanks our everybody audience? for coming. Keep an eye out for what we do next. Absolutely. And thank you, John, for joining us from out of space, as we can see behind you. No, you, you are home now, you know, <laughs> right. somewhere in the galaxy. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for being here today. We'll be in touch soon. And I wish you all the best and stay healthy and stay well and uh, keep in touch. Join us at Build Academy for courses, programs, and for our next master classes like this one. I will let you Thank know. Thank you, John. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye.